Welcome to the Being Human UT podcast, where Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas will discuss issues relative to the humanities and technology at Utah Tech University. And now your hosts for Being Human UT podcast, Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas. Welcome to the podcast. Today, um, my regular partner, Jim Hendigus is not with us. He is on vacation with his family. And I'm very happy to be joined as a co-host by um, Dr. Joy McMurrin, who is an assistant professor of English here at Utah Tech. He's also the coordinator of our technical writing and digital rhetoric and May program and a previous guest on this podcast. So, Joy, we're glad to have you back. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Our guest today is um, Jennifer Keating. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Keating, and she is a writing in the discipline specialist at the University of Pittsburgh. And she does some really exciting things um, in that program that she um, talked to us about when she visited our campus a couple weeks ago. But she's also very much involved in um, talking about uh, AI and talking about how AI directly connects to um, what it is that we do as teaching um, I was a teacher of college composition. Um, her recent book is called AI and Humanity, um, and that is out um, from MIT Press, um, published in 2020. And so, in some ways, this is a third part of a series of podcasts over the last six months that have, you know, not surprisingly been consumed by talking about chat GPT. Um, we did a program with Curtis Larson, who is a, a computer science professor here at Utah Tech. And then two months ago, we talked to Dr. Julie McCown, who teaches composition at SUNU. But today, um, we really want to talk to, to, to Jennifer Keating and get her unique insights about what are the challenges that are being, that are going to occur and that professors all around um, the country and the world are going to face as chat GPT becomes more and more prominent um, in terms of a resource that students can um, activate. So maybe I'll start things off and I'll just say, I'll just ask you, Jennifer, do we press the alarm bells or do we get ready for paradise? What ha What is chat GPT going to do for us in, in the field of writing and composing? Or maybe it's somewhere in between. Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be somewhere in between. And um, I, I do think that that there's a lot of reason for alarm, um, not just in regard to the teaching of writing, but also in terms of just building um, our students as well as our colleagues fluency in understanding what the capabilities are of these systems, um, what their... Uh, functions are in terms of what they've been designed to do, as well as the implications for how it might be uh, a system that's used in ways that uh, were per perhaps not necessarily designed for, but could have been anticipated. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of working with OpenAI and some of the other designers and engineers to really determine um, how to ethically use these systems. Um, and I think in our position as writers ourselves, as well as teachers of writing, um, we have uh, a particularly complicated role to play in thinking about the ways in which these systems might allow us to attend to the particular needs or the prospect of optimization in regards to students accessing these kinds of tools but having to be quite mindful and vigilant in regard to ensuring students continued cognitive and, and skill development um, along a spectrum that we are very familiar with in terms of teaching undergraduates um, those foundational tools in uh, providing summary and synopsis in their writing, but using that as a foothold towards critical thinking, towards interpretation, towards development of argumentation. Um, and I think that uh, the alarm bells are going off um, for good reason. Um, but there are interesting ways in which we can imagine the scaled proficiency in these programs offering 
perhaps um, new ways to interpret data that uh, are is difficult for us to do as as individuals. Yeah, I just I, I really like the phrase that you use there of meeting our students' needs. I mean, that's really what we do um, as teachers of composition. I always try to um, bring home to my students as much as I can, you know, how important um, the ability to write effectively and think critically is. Um, you know, I, I say, I understand most of you taking this class because you have to, you don't want to be here, but you need to understand the, and, and, I, and I don't think I'm overestimating the life changing power that you can attain if you are able to think critically, express, express yourself clearly, especially express yourself clearly through writing. And that's just vital to what we do. And so at its worst, I see AI offering some students who choose to go down that path a way around critical thinking, a way around being able to express themselves effectively in writing. I think it's likely that the way around is going to be temporary and that that's going to be very difficult for many students as they continue to move through the trajectory of their studies. Um, when students start to move past basic principle of summation or gathering and regurgitation of particular information that is usually the very beginning developmentally of students entering a discourse, um, not quite regardless of the discipline, but but in many disciplines. The students are then expected to use that, that corpus, so to speak, if we're using the terminology that's been used for these large language processing system in order to identify trends, in order to uh, determine their own position in relation to that discourse. And without that proficiency, um, what started as a workaround actually then becomes a deficit quite quickly in terms of the student's ability to uh, make inferences or to make uh, uh, perhaps not novel interpretations, but to enter uh, a body of interpretations or, um, you know, what Benedict Anderson has articulated as these imagined communities. Um, we are oftentimes working within our disciplines, within paradigms and hierarchies that necessitate um, early access, early uh, repetition of features, foundational features of, of these disciplines before you can begin to improvise. And without that foundational skill, um, without that practiced technique in critical thinking, analogous to a well-conditioned athlete or to a developing musician, that technique is atrophied um, and or, or not developmentally present. And without that, it's very difficult to build on that foundationless uh, beginning to the student's studies. Um, and the critical work that students who are doing in a composition classroom, especially in the early years of their undergraduate uh, studies, or even in foundational studies in, in, in their specific discipline, whether it's general chemistry, calculus, uh, statistics. Um, those are the raw skills that allow the student to then move into the specialist work later in their studies. And um, if, if a student is outsourcing that practice, those exercises early in their studies, they're um, incredibly disadvantaged as they continue to work through. And I don't think uh, you know, for us, the alarm bells are going off. Uh, for me, when I'm working with colleagues, and you know, I've been in a lot of these seminars over recent weeks, and and conducting some of them myself as well. Um, the idea of um, students being able to outsource these building blocks, not just in in the writing classroom, but potentially in programming as well, and, and in other arenas in which these uh, language processing um, tools have been devised. Um, it, it really is a call for concern. Um, and I don't think it's the case that we can just ban these quite yet. But I do think that we do have to believe that we are uh, empowered and capable to make meaningful regulations of how these systems are being used in order to uh, teach students, teach our colleagues, and really learn ourselves what the capacities are for these programs and work towards identifying 
the arenas where it might be a good idea to begin to regulate their use, um, to do that to safeguard um, labor, wage earning labor in different markets, um, but also to ensure that we are uh, inviting our students to, to build the skills that they're seeking in, in their higher education. Thank you. When, Jennifer, when um, you used a word earlier at the top of this conversation, uh, a small word, but you said with, but, you know, working with. And so often in these conversations about I, AI, I'm hearing for or against, and rarely I'm hearing with. Yeah. And so I think in a society, especially a university culture where expediency is valued, and a lot of our students have this like mentality of work smarter, not harder. And all you know, although I ordinarily value that um, idea and think that students should maximize and leverage whatever tools they have, um, I. I wonder how we inspire, how are you inspiring? What advice do you have for other uh, composition instructors and anybody trying to have this conversation, especially with young adults, about maximizing this opportunity to work with AI and machine learning and, and uh, tools like ChatGPT um, rather than having the tool work for them or in place of them? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, I'm still learning this too, right? So so this is still, um, for me, a, a steep learning curve of, of, of a particular variety. Um, when I'm thinking about how we work with the system, that's predicated on the prospect of learning what the capabilities are of that system. Um, I just read a, a fantastic uh, opinion piece this morning in The Guardian uh, with a very deep critique on uh, the terminology that OpenAI is using in regards to hallucination. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's just a really carefully researched and um, uh, fierce critique of the um, uh, utopian prospects for advancing humanity that have been articulated. Um, but I think that it's it's a useful critique in that it's bringing us down to the conversation on um, what we might actually be able to use the tool to do. And I do think that that can be quite individualized in terms of what a student might need the tool to help them with or what the tool might be able to provide in terms of building efficacy in their workflow on a particular writing task, um, but not necessarily having the tool write a mediocre essay in a particular style. So for example, one of the things that I found interesting that a colleague was doing with some projects um, that he assigned to his students was uh, to have the, the uh, the chat GPT system um, take on a particular angle, right? So they decided to uh, create a project in which the um, the queries um, were, were commanded to be rude and to be untruthful. Um, and, and on some level, I think they were trying to test basically the upper limits of what that would look like before the system would start to divert or move in another direction. The problem that I have with the the premise is that the system is not built to be truthful. It's uh, just sequencing the um, the statistical probability of particular word sequences that are clustered together. So while we might read that and perceive it as truthful because the statistics move in the right direction, that the probability is high, that the word associations are going to lead to what looks like a fact can very easily uh, betray a novice writer to believe that the production of the work is going to um, pass the threshold of their university professor's expectations in assessing a particular assignment. 
that's probably not a good use of the tool for that student, especially if it's a research-based paper. <laughs> and right. The tool has also generated false citations so convincingly that the student's convinced, but the expert instructor already knows that this is just an exercise in BS. And and we've seen that from people. So it's not as though the chat GPT system is creating something new. Um, but what that means is that the, the student isn't really using it in an efficacious way. I can't imagine a student who's working with um, a, a particular set of ideas generating um, a, a, a corpus of sorts where they're putting in, you know, citations and they're trying to use the system to build an, or, an outline, for example, or to identify, you know, common common uses of a particular word or, or something along those lines where the, the tool can be used for organizational principles for a student who's really um, having trouble in that area or for a student who really wants to work on um, particular grammatical conventions, for example. There are ways in which you can imagine this tool being used as a, a complement to developing skills, as a supplement. Um, but I do think that that requires individualized coaching, working with students to determine what their needs are and to then really with um, uh, some confidence determining whether or not the tool can actually serve as a, a complement to those efforts that the students are undertaking in the course of a semester or in a particular class. Um, and so the notion of working with, I think, is very complicated. It's highly individualized. And it requires tremendously more proficiency or articulation of what uses are recommended for working with these tools by their designers, um, even if it's the case that then teachers improvise in terms of identifying novel, interesting ways to meet their students' needs or to meet the ambitions of the teacher too, right? So oftentimes we wanna take our students um, beyond their needs into a new territory that might beget success or excellence that we hadn't quite imagined yet, but that our students fashion by virtue of their own innovation and creativity. Oh, very good. Yeah, that, that's been my, uh, what, what you're saying is, is something that I've been thinking about a lot as well, that that seems to be, to me, the best way at, at, as far as it goes right now. And like you, I'm, I'm obviously still learning this, but when I've heard people say I want to work with it, exactly what you said is what I envision. Um, it, it creates a pretty well-constructed outline of ideas, and it can help students in that area. But the example that you used in your presentation when you were here about how it took a question and just kind of, you know, worked around the semantic um, instruction of that question in order to produce a very superficial, very shallow response that was just in some ways regurgitating kind of generalities that were that it was able to draw from the question. Um, that's where I'm running into problems that students don't see that as a difference. I mean, right now, you know, the, the, I know that the the plagiarism uh, detection software that we use here has added an AI feature in the last couple of months. Um, I'm a little bit unsure of the accuracy of that, but I think my experience has been still right now the best way to detect this is exactly what you showed on the screen when you were here. This kind of very superficial um, um, level of writing that really gets to you know, doesn't get very far at all when it comes to the analyzing or um, interpreting or anything like that. So I envision myself coming up with a policy that says we're going to use it at times or something similar. And what we're going to do is that kind of individualized coaching that you were talking about, this generation of outlines that then become the basis for what that you can do um, later on. You know, I, I quickly was able to see, because I had some writing that I knew my students had done, they had done it in class, I got to know the voice of those students. Then when I came across an AI paragraph, it was pretty clear. The problem I'm seeing is what happens when I'm teaching an online class, and I don't really know 
what the student's authentic voice is. I don't ever really, potentially, might not ever really see the student's authentic voice, and then that becomes a problem. And the other thing that popped into my mind when you talked about the way that it answered that question is I'm, I've switched my emphasis in my composition class to APA a couple of years ago, and of course APA stresses paraphrase, paraphrase is what they want, uh, as opposed to direct quotation. If you take the text of the passage, you put it into chat GPT and you say, paraphrase this, then that becomes a really big problem because that crucial skill um, and of paraphrasing would be lost simply by putting it in there. And I'm imagining, because I've been playing with it myself, that's going to be a lot harder for me to detect when an AI generates a paraphrase of a passage that is inputted into it. Yeah, and what you're pointing to, I think, is um, it's a very nuanced and complex relationship to the value of education. So the the complexity of these negotiations that we are having individually with our students at scale across the comp classrooms uh, with first year students, for example, um, but at at another organizational level higher again within that paradigm of higher education is a real uh, and candid conversation on, I think, certain distinct distinctions between the alchemy and the complexity of education versus the transaction of credentialing. Hmm. And so for students who uh, need a particular credential, in order to access a particular foothold or the prospect of a particular foothold in uh, employment in the future, this expedience associated with presenting their authentic voice or uh, a mechanized voice from an AI tool in exchange for a grade that gives rise to exchange for credit for a particular class, that gives rise to uh, credentialing for a particular degree that gives rise to access to a particular career path allows us to think about the ways in which this modality of transaction is a miscue, right? Or a misnomer for education. The complexity yeah. of education is thinking, of course, about job readiness and a capacity to contribute to a robust economy. It's also civic responsibility. It's also an indication of the responsibility of the individual citizen to the collective. And when we're not actually codifying that conversation within the immediate and urgent concerns associated with the transaction of the assignment for a particular grade, that is the, the individual transaction uh, that keeps that entire modality of higher education as a credentialing institution alive, then we are ignoring uh, the the alarm bells that really do go off with this kind of processing, right? Because mm -hmm. one of the things that strikes me in the course of um, our conversation, Joy and Bandy, is, is thinking about the ways in which this is ironically adding labor for each of us. Yeah. Right, the, this idea of the efficacy of a tool to produce an essay that we're reading, not because it's novel or interesting, right? We're we're using these as exercises to help students build basic skills in summation, paraphrase, summary that might give rise to sophisticated, interesting interpretation, criticism, argumentation creative utterance. These essays are not fun to read. This is all labor. And we're adding yet another permutation to that labor when we're thinking about the prospect of meeting the student where they are and identifying the ways in which these uh, tools might serve as enhancements or prosthetics in the work that they're doing as thinkers, as communicators. Um, but, but we're being distracted by this added labor in thinking about how we tailor the tools because we're also not necessarily schooled in the fluency that we need to begin to think about the capacity or the capability of the system 
to serve as a tool that's assisting the student in the driver's seat, right? We, for generations in, in Compton in particular, have thought very deliberately about the decentering of the instructor's authority in a classroom to meet students where they are. This is complicating those relationships again because what we conceive of or believe to know about each of these students by virtue of that authentic voice could be mediated. It could be replaced. And so the, the value, um, perhaps even like the, the moral contribution that we're offering, our civic contribution that we're offering through our teaching is corrupted slightly by virtue of the complexity of this potential substitute. But the way that we're trained, I mean, I would say that we're not training AI for open AI, but we are, right? Because we're also, unless you're paying $20 a month, we're providing free labor also as they continue to build out this, this system to train the system. So we're, we're doing double duty, right? But we don't actually get to walk to graduation and celebrate with the families of the chatbot. Um, so, so the, the alarm bells are going off, um, as, as I am also trying to think carefully about ways in which we can um, harness some of the extraordinary contribution in terms of just testing an idea and whether or not it's achievable, evident in in these chat GPT systems. Um, but it, it the the irony is not lost on me in regards to the the strange labor that's being produced. For us as instructors, I suppose. Yeah. It feels like the more opportunities there are for students and in anybody, any producer of content, um, more opportunities to sidestep that or outsource that, the more we realize the onus is on each individual to decide the purpose of their education, what they want to get out of their time at university or any cert certification course or anything. Um, and some students, I have this conversation frequently with first year experienced students, but not as frequently with my upper division or even graduate students, the idea of asking them, you know, this, nobody ever said they're going to college to earn points. Yet when it comes down to it, oftentimes in a rush or the demands of family and work and other things bear down on our students, um, the points are the thing they start to worry about. And so then that's where the idea of expedient work comes into play and they forget why they're here. Yeah, and I, and I think that can be really complicated when students then become graduates, graduates who are then employees and are tasked with particular responsibilities that seem commensurate with the training associated with that credential. But yeah, you don't have access to the tools that you use to achieve that. Um, that's highly problematic. Yeah. Right? Because then your livelihood might be dependent on um, your ability to teach yourself or to learn, but you're not conditioned in that yeah. practice. Because so much of what we're teaching our students is how to learn. The this content that we teach is, um, I wouldn't say it's irrelevant. I think it's fluid yeah. and, and it's evolutionary um, in its nature. But, but the skill to learn how to learn, yeah. um, the skill and the practice of critical engagement, the skill and the practice of recall of information, the skill and the practice of uh, reading complex texts and developing a lens um, and an ability to narrate or describe features of that lens to move from task to task. Those are robust skills that are transferable, um, but it's very difficult um, in your learning process, regardless of age, to be able to identify that in process until you realize that the foundation is shaky or you begin to realize that the foundation is robust because you can do more complex tasks. 
Um, but to your point with expedience and and the notion of gamifying education, gamifying features yeah. of life, uh, we respond to that as humans, much like we'll respond to storytelling. These are things that we enjoy across cultures, across languages. Um, but gamification isn't necessarily going to be the ways in which our lives are lived. It's interesting. I mean, just having this conversation with you today makes me feel like we all need to pull way back that the that the scope of the conversation has been on chat GPT, the tool, rather than the task or the purpose or the aim of why we are compelled to even use the tool um, and to what uses we can leverage it. Um, and so I think it's good to think through this and to pull way back and take a much wider view of it before we dig into the tool itself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to come to terms with that myself because it some of it is puzzling and and you know, the more I read about this, having not been trained as as a, a computer scientist, but but bringing the lens that we each bring from the communities and from the practice of writing to to some of these concerns, the novelty and the the playfulness, I think, captures much of our imagination in just playing around with mm -hmm. the system's ability to mimic. I think that that oftentimes as humans we're fascinated. Sometimes I think um, to ill effects with mimicry um, or or. Uh, uh, portrayals of our likeness. Um, and I think that there's a lot of that in this that is understandable and and playful. Um, but the stakes of the game are incredibly high for so many individuals and groups that have been historically vulnerable anyway. And I think that that really needs to be front and center and leadership, whether it's in a classroom, leadership in institutions of higher education, but civic leadership, um, uh, economic leadership is really needed because of the fragility of the moment we're in as well. Um, yeah. When we're thinking about the, the prospect of um, unverifiable, borderline arrogant utterances coming from these systems <laughs> in moments of acute disinformation and uh, low level trust in governments the world over, we're a little bit nuts to be playing around with the novelty of this toy at the moment, um, rather than really paying attention to the perspective ill effects. Um, I don't think that the alarm bells can lead to just shutting it, the whole thing down. I think we have to lean into it a little bit. Um, but some of the conversation that I would like to bring parallel to this are uh, perhaps from our bioethicist side of the fence in regards to CRISPR, um, conversations with our colleagues in terms of development of novel pharmaceutical treatments or therapies that um, bring forward these deep but well-practiced concerns associated with introduction of new tech, new techniques in experimental spaces, but also really thinking about where the civic responsibility lies with bringing some of these tools into the wild, so to speak, without really thinking about the, the ill effects of that scaled use. Um, or even thinking about the infringements on things like copyright when we're thinking about our colleagues in the arts or um, creative writing whose work may or may not have just been thrown into the corpus, right? Um, and, and just because something's on the internet doesn't mean that it doesn't have copyright um, and doesn't, you know, indicate the, the labor um, expended by by our colleagues in different disciplines. So well, yeah, that, that pullback I think is worthwhile, but I'm not sure exactly what that would look like. I think it's hard to pull back because these all of the things you mentioned are new frontiers. 
right? And it's like the Wild West. We want to tame, we want to domesticize, we want to rein in that which is wild. And that's part of our, um, you know, conqueror mentality. And, you know, we've geographically um, explored, I think, um, to the extent that that we're able. And so we have taken that frontier or conquer mentality into other contexts, into new ways of thinking. And this is just, um, you know, you've you mentioned this idea of playfulness, um, but it's also um, in an effort to f- explore and find out the unknown. And in doing that, we might unleash something. That. Yeah, and 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 I think we've we have been around the block long enough to have learned that the adventures in regards to um, the westward migration associated in the United States context with Manifest Destiny led to the rupture and the violent mm-hmm. uh, destruction of various peoples and languages. Um, the the concept of exploration um, in much of our human history has been at the expense of other populations. Um, the notion of, of freedom and an expansion has oftentimes been to the detriment of other individual or groups' freedom or prospect yeah. of expansion. And so thinking about the ways in which these object lessons have called us to reflect on those implications called us to consider individual power negotiations with care, with criticism, with elements of ownership and responsibility, with the eye towards the prospect of building trust in the future, I think is really useful for us to appropriate in in some of these moments because the notion of exploration, whether it's figurative or literal, has shown us the benefits and costs and allows us to potentially translate our understanding or reflections from those moments in history or other political contexts to really perhaps give ourselves permission to not just wring our hands with all of this kind of frontier breaking and disruption, but to actually use our critical abilities and identify what the variables are or the concerns are in perhaps each of the use functions or each of the glaring concerns associated with these developments in things like the tools that we're working with, whether it's ChatGPT, whether it's CRISPR, um, whether it's these extraordinary vaccines, right, that we're able to develop in in response to to COVID-19. But when we're thinking of um, standards that, that allow us to perhaps slow down and look at the families of concern that are emerging rather than looking at them all as one, I think the standard model used by IEEE is is a good example, right? Mm -hmm. Where they bring together domain experts to discuss in in the minutia, the capabilities, the concerns, in particular um, advancements, and work with domain experts who can then also work with civic leaders to think about whether or not regulation is something that should be discussed or or uh, at least um, devised. Um, articulation of robust policy. It, all, not all policy is regulation. Um, it can be recommendations to institutions that are impacted or exposed in different ways to these particular advances. But I do think that there's different ways in which we can quiet in the noise of progress, right? That we've seen at other moments in time. We've seen this, you know, at at length with Walter Benjamin's writing on uh, mechanical reproduction, right? So we can think about photography. We can think about the telephone. Um, There's other examples of disruption that allow us to clue into the ways in which we don't necessarily have to subject ourselves to this tidal weight of, of progress, but really bring our critical eye and our positionality in regards to a historical moment to leverage some wisdom, to leverage some critical engagement and really think about the ways in which we might be able to to pause things a little bit, to be a bit more intentional with the ways that we're using this and 
and perhaps just cast aside this this novel um uh uh espousal of disruption as as valuable maybe it's not always valuable maybe disruption actually can be destructive in particular moments and if that's the case how do we then react to those concerns yeah that that's something that is is going to be crucial in in, in near future and um probably has time for maybe one more uh, question and, and i'll bring it back to chat gpt a little bit on your campus what is the climate as far as producing a unified set of policies and procedures to deal with chat gpt because i think that's something that all uh, institutions of higher education are going to have to grapple with yeah um we have a really large english department so what we've had already are i think three panel discussions as well as a set of um, practices for faculty to identify ways to skill up on, on using the platform and identifying its capabilities, as well as to think about the ways in which um, individuals can uh, consider how they want to use or address students using the tool in their class. But I do think that the initial reaction that I've seen in our department and then also campus-wide is uh, using this as an opportunity to band together and learn together. Um, I'm participating at the moment in an AI seminar, interdisciplinary seminar that was um, very quickly put together um, by colleagues across campus. And it seems like maybe 50 faculty from throughout the university are participating in that at the moment, learning about the details of how the system works, as well as really pulling from um, expert knowledge on the campus to uh, think together on what the implications might be for the development of a system like ChatGPT. But I think rather than go hot with regulation or policy, what I've seen in terms of practice so far at this university has been a collective um, effort to, to discuss and to learn from one another um, depending on the domains that are, that are available here. Um, I do imagine as things continue to evolve that that will start to materialize into some recommended practices in the classroom. Um, but I haven't seen language in particular in regards to academic integrity quite yet. Um, but I do think that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg because of the deeper concerns that are emerging with students and faculty um, considering how to how to work with this system. Yeah, it's just too early, right? Yeah. I think we're in a similar place and we have had a couple of roundtable discussions. I, I really like this idea of perhaps seminars in which we bring in experts and you know, from across the campus to deal with it. Um, in our department, we really have been tasked with coming up with a policy for our individual classrooms. And I think it would be wise for us to, you know, sit down and compare those um, in terms of what we think works and what we think maybe doesn't work so well, because um, that's going to be the, the, that kind of on the ground experience is going to be the most useful in guiding us, I think. I think that's right. And, and learning about how your colleagues in computer science are discussing the um, the expectations that they have for students in, in early programming classes, for example. Um, discussing with your colleagues how they address the, uh, the comparable capabilities in chat GPT 3, 3.5, in comparison to other tools that might have been used in the programming domain in the past. I think that can be really um, instructive. Um, faculty and business who are using these tools who I met with when I was on your campus um, really demonstrate the ways in which the expert can work with these tools in regards to efficiency 
or scaling work or developing scenarios for the classroom that are more difficult to develop without the tool. Um, so learning a little bit about how experts assert their authority in working with the tool in order to aid their teaching or, or the work that they want to undertake in the classroom, I think can be really instructive in terms of identifying the limitations and the capabilities of the tool when you're also thinking about the ways in which you can begin to describe that um, in regard to parameter when you're working with your own students and, and thinking about how it works. But I do think a lot of this is really effusive and complicated, um, but I do think that working with our colleagues who are using these tools in different domains can be quite generative. Um, and it's not the case that it's just folks in comp or in English learning from their techies on the other side of the, the campus, but that actually there is a legit exchange and iterative understanding of how your community of faculty are positioning themselves as individuals and as a collective group at the university in relation to these advancing tools. I think it can be really valuable and it, it helps students also begin to understand that your uh, instructors are not just working within the domain of the fiefdom of their singular classroom, but instead this is a cultural conversation uh, pertaining to what education looks like on your campus. Yeah, no, that's that's great advice. And uh, ask your deans to organize them. Yes, it is definitely on the agenda. So that's where the infrastructure of administration is quite useful, right? Because the faculty can rely on their leadership to provide the opportunity to convene. And then if the faculty come ready to share those practices, that's where you can actually have that infrastructure of the institution buttress the efforts of of the instructors to the benefit of the students. Definitely. That's my way. Um just as we're sitting here talking, I just I've got a an, an initiative for the Humanities Center for next year. <laughs> the a series of workshops, maybe a, 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 a faculty learning group. I think that's 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 the way we're gonna go forward with that. So thank you for uh, helping me inspiring me for for some things that we can do here on this campus. And thanks to um, Jennifer Keating for her, her valuable insights on this topic. Um, it's been great talking to you. Thanks to um, Brian McBurns for joining me and, and, and asking some great questions as well. Um, we hope to uh, uh, we hope to see you in the next broadcast. Remember, you can get this podcast wherever you um, go to get your podcasts. Thanks, everyone, for participating. This has been the Being Human UT podcast with Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas. Please follow and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. From Utah Tech University, this is the Being Human UT podcast.